A Basis for Choice Our analysis of death is part of our search for a complete ontological description of being in the world. Mortality often seems to be an insuperable obstacle to grasping the ontological structure of human existence as a single unified whole. But our analysis demonstrates that understanding our mortality is actually a precondition for any individual to attain existential integrity. Our existence can become genuinely individual and whole only by seeing death ontologically as an ever-present impossible possibility that makes the possible impossibility of our existence inevitable. Integrity the unity and wholeness of essentially finite enigmatic beings and their endeavors has both a theoretical and an existential significance. Integrity is not just a fundamental quality of good phenomenological analysis, but the keynote of an authentic relation to both death and life. Our emphasis on integrity or wholeness may appear arbitrary, but it is not. Surely, acknowledging one's own mortality includes accepting death as a present threat to our existence. It highlights that what is at stake is not just the content of any given moment, but the entire course of that life taken as a whole. If the quality of our entire life is at stake in our everyday existential choices, how can we choose to make our life into a single integral whole? Should seeing our individual life choices in the context of our entire life demand that we should aim for narrative unity? Would it not be equally authentic to include as many different activities, achievements, and modes of life as possible before death intervenes? We distinguish our ontological account of authenticity from traditional philosophy. Our idiosyncratic use of ethical religious concepts like integrity, guilt, and conscience might seem to align our ideas with normative concepts of morality and ethics in religion and theology. However, we view integrity as a purely positive realm, defined as the state or condition of being whole, complete, unbroken, sound, in perfect condition. We can be authentic only to the degree that we possess integrity. The traditional view is that human beings continuously confront the question of choosing how we should live. So we must identify some standard or set of values to guide our choices. Moreover, if that standard is used to inform all our choices, it adds significance to our whole life. If each choice is made by reference to the same standard, the life that grows from that series of choices will manifest an underlying unity. The question of what gives meaning to one's life as a whole makes the same conjunction between authenticity and wholeness that we propose in our analysis. At this point, traditional philosophy goes on to suggest a religious answer to the question of life's meaning. But is that really necessary, or would it be an arbitrary superimposition of values? How do we choose? Suppose that we begin by aiming at a specific goal or achievement to give our life meaning, the pursuit of power or wealth, the development of a talent. Such goals have significance only because we desire them. In this view, our individual wants and inclinations are the source of the meaning of our life. But such dispositions can alter. Our tastes and desires may change. This means that no desire or disposition can add meaning or value to my life as a whole. Our desires may change or disappear, but the question of how to live our life remains for as long as we are alive. Staking our life upon temporary changing desires deprives it of meaning. This view actually shows that the foundation of my life is not whatever desires I happen to have, but my capacity to choose among them. According to traditional philosophy, we can avoid self-deception only by explicitly grounding our lives on our capacity to choose, transforming the conditional array of our desires into unconditional values.
For example, we might moderate our sexual impulses by choosing an unconditional commitment to marriage or commit to a certain vocation on the basis of a talent. We thereby choose not to permit changes in contingent factors to alter the shape of our lives. This constancy maintains the unity and integrity of our lives, regardless of fluctuations in the intensity of our desires, thereby creating a self for ourselves from ourselves. This version of the traditional understanding of the ethical life implies a second reason for connecting authenticity and wholeness. If authenticity amounts to establishing and maintaining genuine selfhood, the fluctuations of individual desires and dispositions cannot form an adequate basis for it. The resulting multiplicity of unrelated existential fragments would not cohere into a whole that we could claim as our own. But can holding unconditionally to a choice be an adequate source of life's meaning? The capacity to choose is still only a part of a person's life, but no part can give meaning to the whole of which it is a part. What justifies the capacity to choose as the basis of the meaning of our life? What gives choice its meaning? The question of the meaning of our whole life is not answerable in terms of any part of that life. Our life as a whole can acquire meaning only by relating it to something beyond it. Only such a transcendental standard could give a genuinely unconditional answer to the question of the meaning of one's life. Only by relating ourselves to such an absolute, relativizing the importance of the finite, can we properly answer the question existence poses. Such an absolute standard is, for traditional philosophy, just another name for God. We can relate properly to each moment of our existence only by relating our lives as a whole to God and submitting to the moral standards of religious life. Our phenomenological analysis of death gains significance against this background. We accept the conjunction between authenticity and wholeness, but we show that this conjunction can be properly forged by relating appropriately to one's mortality. Thus, authenticity and integrity are obtainable without resorting to theology, to an absolute transcendental conception beyond our as-lived experience. By understanding death as our own most possibility and anticipating it in every existential choice we make, human beings can live authentic and integral lives without having to relate those lives to a transcendent deity or an arbitrary system of morality. Certainly, the question of life's meaning is an inescapable part of human life. It can be properly understood only by acknowledging the contingency and finitude of our life. But acknowledging our finitude does not require comparison with an infinite, unconditioned realm or entity. Such a comparison implies that conditioned human life is a limitation rather than a limit, a set of constraints that deprive us of participation in a better mode of life, rather than a set of conditions essential to determine the recognizably human form of any human life. Existential wholeness requires only an acknowledgement of human mortality, and only those forms of traditional theology that understand conditions as limits rather than limitations are compatible with a proper ontological understanding of human existence. A proper grasp of conditioned human existence does require relating it to something beyond its scope, but it does not require that we relate it to some essentially unconditioned thing or being. The relevant context is not that of a transcendent deity, but non-existence or nothingness.